So back when we lived in California, uh, there was a local chiropractic office um, that was doing a canned food drive, and the advertisement went something like, hey, come and get a free consultation um, for just one can of, um, one canned food. And I thought, you know, I've, I've never been to a chiropractic office, but I often will have lower back pain due to pinched nerves and things like that. And it is like right within my price range, you know, free. So I, I made up, uh, I made the appointment and I brought my can of green beans in ready um, to get uh, kind of, um, Uh, fixed from my back pain and so about 30 minutes went by they took me to the back room they ran some tests and scans um, checking my spine my posture and other kind of doctory type things and uh, mind you I'm at this point I I feel pretty good like I'm I'm feeling great like I, I have no real cause of concern other than you know the occasional aches and pains and then came my test results and and they asked me hey would you would you like to see your results and I thought sure I, I guess they did some x-rays and so we had those those pictures right in front of that uh, in front of me and, and I don't know about you but looking at these 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 pictures I don't know what I'm looking at like I don't know if I'm broken if I'm fine if there's issues in there I just I just don't know what these pictures look like. And so I'm looking at this kind of dumbfounded at what I'm supposed to see here. And then they said, well, would you like us to show you um, these pictures and, and what your back's doing and your posture? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I guess. Sh- sure. And so then they began to like contort my body. And I just thought, man, I look like a monster. Like there's something really wrong with me. I, my, my whole, my whole um, demeanor, my whole posture is just wrong. And I left that consultation extremely discouraged, thinking, my goodness, like I've, I, I'm never coming back to this place. Like they, I came in here feeling good, and now I feel worse being here. And the only thing that I could think was, I, I, I feel like I walk around looking so deformed and like I'm just this monster (laughs) walking around you know um, uh, I know that's not all chiropractic offices but uh, it was it really brought me it really humbled me a, a little bit now I don't know about you but following Jesus can feel like that sometimes Following Jesus can feel like that sometimes, right? You come to Jesus because you sense there's something inside that that is broken that needs fixing, Uh, but then you discover that in your brokenness, you're a whole lot more broken than what you first realized. And you start thinking, man, maybe this is just, maybe this isn't you, but a lot of people start thinking, man, I thought being a Christian was supposed to make you feel a whole lot better about yourself than worse. And Jesus, he had a way of talking with people, communicating to crowds, that he drew out our need for him, that he he revealed where our needs and our hurts and the ugliness was. And he often told stories that would drive people to kind of um, shining a light on that, but for people to see their need for him. That Jesus never communicated for the sake of entertainment, but always to call people to action. Sometimes people would hear his message and they would leave never wanting to return because, you know, it just got too personal for them. Got too personal. And many people would walk away because they would rather hear a lie that makes them feel good than the truth that would initially sting but in the end save a life. In our story that we're going to be looking at today, we are met with the reaction of the crowd toward Jesus' ministry and message. And what's fascinating with this story is that it is exclusively focused in on the rejection of Jesus. This crowd and the leaders rejecting Jesus, even his own family rejecting Jesus. The summary theme that kind of captures the heart of our passage this morning is John chapter 1 verse 11. At the very beginning of the gospel, we are um, kind of foretold of what Jesus' ministry would look like. It says this, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And so as we look at our, uh, our passage today, this is exactly what we see kind of taking place. Jesus is rejected by the very ones who should have seen him and received him. 
But the question that I want to focus our attention on today is what action is this story driving us to? What action is this story trying to lead us to act on? So as we um, dig into the story, I want us to focus on asking that question. If you don't have a Bible or you you forgot your Bible, um, Brian and Chris, they're going to walk around um, with some Bibles. Um, Feel free just to raise your hand, let them know that you're in need of a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, keep this. This is our gift to you. But if you uh, if you don't have a Bible, we're going to be in John chapter 7. So you can go ahead and turn there, John chapter 7. As you're making your way there, um, it's important to remember what came right before this story. Uh, in the previous chapter, in chapter 6, uh, Jesus gave um, arguably one of the hardest teachings that he has ever preached. And the result of his message was, um, uh, was alarming. Um, supporters just just left in droves. They left him. They departed from him, no longer desiring to follow him. And we have a, we have a map, if I can pull that up. Um, the undercurrent is this, that Jesus is rejected by the Jewish people uh, in the north, a region known as uh, Galilee. You can see that right between Samaria a uh, region known as Galilee. The Jews up there, um, they departed from him, they rejected him. And now the story in chapter 7, it shifts to the rejection from the Jewish people in the southern region, a region known as Judea, um, where kind of the Jewish headquarters is in Jerusalem. So John chapter 7, starting in verse 1. After this, that is the, the people, thousands of people deserting Jesus, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go uh, about in Judea, the the southern region, because um, the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. So the people in the north, they've deserted him, and the people in the south, they want him dead. Um, There's just conflict all over the area for wherever Jesus goes. Um, But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one wants to become a public figure, acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Uh, The festival of tabernacles or the festival of booths, uh, it was one of the most popular Jewish holidays that people would travel to Jerusalem for. I mean, it was this mass camping trip. Uh, in Judea, sometime between the month of September and October. Uh, it was a week-long camp out where the Jews would camp remembering Israel wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. And so everybody around this time is making preparations to head south and prepare for this camping trip. And Jesus' brothers, they start pressuring Jesus. They start pressuring him, hey, go down there, show yourself, impress everyone. It's likely that Jesus' teaching um, not only um, brought criticism Jesus' way, but it probably brought some shame on the family. And so this this, teaching that Jesus gave, it it likely embarrassed his family uh, when Jesus kind of pulled the Bart Simpson card when he told everybody, bite me, you know, uh, from the last chapter. Um, That combined with the fact that Jesus made a lot of commotion. He made a lot of commotion around this area. I mean, he fed um, a a crowd of upwards between 15 to 20,000 people with um, bread and fish, mimicking this kind of Moses in the wilderness um, moment. And also when he went down to Jerusalem and he healed a guy on the Sabbath, um, thus breaking the the, the man, the, the um. Uh, the human custom that was established around the Sabbath really infuriated the leaders. He, start, he caused a lot of commotion. Um, and what you would expect is you would expect somebody who is doing those kind of things to crank up the hype, get everyone excited, <laughs> do more things. Don't act like a recluse. Don't go into hiding. Don't be discreet. In other words, his brother's words probably sound like, hey, Jesus, Go and campaign in Jerusalem since you're such a big shot here. Go. His brothers didn't believe in him. And so here's how Jesus responds. Verse 6. Therefore Jesus told them, My time is not yet here, 
for you any time will do. And Jesus here, he's focusing on his public act of coronation as king, king of Israel. This is what he's focused on, which it was the crucifixion, which would be the crowning of his kingship. Uh, Verse 7, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival, I'm, I'm not going up, uh, up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. After he had said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now looking at the story, um, it looks like Jesus kind of told a fib. You said you're not going, and then you go. Is Jesus lying? Did did Jesus kind of pivot? Did he change his mind somehow during the course of thinking over his brother's questions? No, the, the question that his brothers put to him was to go and show yourself as a public figure. What kind of public figure are they thinking of? They are thinking of not just any kind of person, but the Messiah, the messianic king, the promised Jewish king who would come to save his people and lead his people. And what Jesus is saying to them is not that he doesn't plan to go to Jerusalem, but that he doesn't plan to go to Jerusalem at this time to prove himself in a public way like the way that they were wishing he would. Now is not the right time for me to reveal that I am the king of Israel. The time for him to prove that, that he was the Messiah, when when, when he would be lifted up upon the earth, when he would be crucified, that would be the moment where the world would know that this is the king. But Jesus can clearly sense that if he is not wise in how he navigates his um, uh, walking around Palestine and in Jerusalem, um, the crucifixion couldn't come earlier for him. Now keep in mind, this is, this is about the last year of Jesus' ministry at this point. This is the last leg of his journey before he will be crucified. But right now, that's not the time. Let's keep reading. Verse 11. Now, at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, Where is he? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, He's a good man. Others replied, No, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leaders. Um, The religious leaders in Jesus' day, uh, they they are on the hunt to find Jesus. They know that Jesus is going to be there, and so they are likely waiting as people are pooling in the town. They are waiting to catch Jesus and likely kill him uh, without drawing too much attention to themselves. They want Jesus um, cut out of the scene, and as people start pouring in, it becomes apparent um, that the focus of this holiday, the focus of this holiday has shifted from um, looking and thinking and reflecting about Israel's wandering to talking and thinking about the identity of Jesus. And the religious leaders, this must have caused their skin to crawl. They must have been boiling angry. Why is everyone focusing on Jesus and not remembering our past, what this holiday is about? What is clear is that the crowds they're divided about Jesus. They're divided. They don't know what to think of Jesus. Everyone has a different opinion about who Jesus is. They all have strong opinions. But where the crowds found agreement in their division was making sure they kept their opinions quiet in front of the leaders. They were afraid of what would happen to them if they put some kind of stake in the ground to say, well, this is what we think about Jesus. And I mean, think about this. Even the people in the crowd that thought, yeah, Jesus is crazy. Jesus is deceiving everyone. Even they (laughs) wouldn't publicly say that out loud. They were afraid. What would cause these guys to be afraid of the Jewish leaders when they agreed with the Jewish leaders? Well, it's very likely that the Jewish leaders did not want this holiday to be focused on anything other than what the holiday stood for, which was the Israel's wandering in the wilderness. 
And so if you brought anything up about Jesus, even a negative thing about Jesus, to them it was probably too much publicity for Jesus. And I just find it interesting that even back in the first century, there was pressure put on the people to keep them silent from sharing their opinions about Jesus. Fascinating. And it was effective. It was really, really effective until the elephant in the room himself showed up. Look at verse 14. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple court and he began to teach. Jesus likely came in the middle of the festival because everybody's guards would have been dropped at this point and he could slip in undetected and then Jesus slips in and he starts teaching the people. The Jews there were amazed and they asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? Now, it's not really evident in in English, but the phrase the Jews or uh, also the Jewish leaders is the exact same phrase in Greek. They're not different. It's the same. And and throughout the Gospel of John and specifically here in this chapter, any time Um, John wants to cue us in that he's talking about the broader crowd, he will usually use the word crowd. Like, here is the broader audience, but anytime he wants to talk about um, the select group of Jewish people, the Jewish leaders, he will use this phrase, the Jews, implying the Jewish leaders. Now, the reason that matters is because Jesus is standing in front of the Jewish leaders, As he's teaching, he's standing in front of the Jewish leaders and the Jewish teachers, along with a whole crowd, everyone there listening into Jesus. And all the teachers, they would have undergone some rabbinical training under some really high class teachers in Israel, and they would have known Jesus did not learn from one of them, and yet his teaching, it's masterful. This is a work of art, how he is teaching like this. And so as the religious leaders, they are wondering about this. Jesus um, um, brilliantly transitions from teaching into a subtle rebuke of the religious leaders. Verse 16, Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. In other words, If you actually practice what you preach, you will find out that my words are true. But if you're not living for God's will, you will remain convinced that I'm misguided. And what does that say uh, about why the religious leaders are opposing Jesus? Mind you, this is the full audience. Everyone is listening, and you, you as a religious leader, you are on the hot seat here. What does that say to the whole crowd about why you're opposing Jesus? Well, it says that the only reason the leaders and the crowd of contrarians are rejecting Jesus is because they are choosing not to live in obedience to God. And so... The stakes get high, very, very high. Because if you're a leader in that room and you're thinking, well, Jesus is a false prophet, but now if I publicly say that, what I'm saying is I'm saying I agree with Jesus that I'm actually living in disobedience to God's will which is not a good place to be, right? I mean, this, this puts you kind of in a, a, a rock in a, in a hard place because you are living in disobedience to God and God is calling you out on that. So Jesus continues the same point. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? Again, Jesus' point is really clear. You are not living obediently for God, and that is why you are rejecting me. It is your disobedience that has led to your rejection of me. Verse 20, you are demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? Uh, This is a way of saying, um, you're crazy, man. (laughs) Modern translation um verse 21 jesus said to them i did one miracle and you're all amazed yep because moses gave you circumcision though actually it did not come from moses but from the patriarchs you circumcise a boy on the sabbath 
Now, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. So what is Jesus' point by bringing up Sabbath and circumcision and healing? What is his point? His point is this. The religious leaders are the ones who are parting ways from God, And they have a clever way of dressing up their disobedience with religious language. They have a really clever way of disobeying God and then justifying that to the masses. And after their disobedience has led them, uh, after their disobedience has led them to hardening their own hearts, and that disobedience, that hardness of heart, has blocked them from hearing God and responding to God. And here you have these leaders who have studied the words of God and they have done so rigorously but with disobedience heart that now when the word of God himself stands in front of them, they cannot recognize it. Instead, they reject it. Now, as an aside, this is what sin does. Sin hardens our hearts. It blinds us from seeing truth. And any time we, we, we do have unconfessed sin in our lives, it always has a hardening effect on on our hearts, on our lives. Sometimes when we feel like God is distant from us or we feel like our relationship with God is not where it used to be, it's actually really good practice just to begin thinking and asking and praying, God, is there any unconfessed sin in my own heart? Is there anything that is, that is um, standing in the gap between me and you? I mean, Jesus has atoned for our sin, but our sin that we, that we keep inside, it does create barriers. It creates this sort of relational barrier. And so it's a good habit just to ask, God, is there any unconfessed sin in my life? Two passages that I always think about when it comes to us confessing our sin and, and bringing that before God is um, 1 John 1, 9 and 1 John 3, 19. 1 John 1, 9 says this, If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. And then 1 John three nineteen. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in His presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and He knows everything. In other words, if you are a Christian who confesses your sin to God, you can go to the bank knowing God forgives your sins completely and finally. That Jesus has fully um, taken all of the punishment of our sins on the cross. That is done away with. We do not sin guilty before God. But our hearts, our hearts do not operate like that. Our hearts are like this ruthless tyrant that condemns us constantly, bringing out of the closets things that we've already asked for forgiveness for, things that the blood of Jesus has already purified us for. Um, And our hearts do not operate the way that God operates. And John is saying what you need to know is that that, uh, God is greater than our hearts, that God is more merciful than even our own um, tyrant hearts that constantly persecute and remind us of all of the ugliness and every time that happens we remind ourselves that God is greater than our hearts even when our hearts are condemning us we know where we stand before the Lord because Christ is Christ has been crucified for us so that being said what does this passage teach us well it tells us that the leader's disobedience to God is the root issue leading them to the rejection of Jesus. That it is the leader's um, disobedience to God that is leading them to silence their society from speaking publicly about Jesus. And keep your opinions about Jesus to a simple, quiet murmuring in the background. Don't you dare speak out loud about who Jesus is. And what Jesus has done here is he's called a spade a spade. (laughs) They don't want Jesus around because Jesus is a threat to their public image. If they admit Jesus is right, they also have to admit they are wrong. And contrary to how that may sound, that is actually a really beautiful and liberating truth. Because when you do that, when you acknowledge where your sin is at, what your sin is, we find a merciful and gracious God who will meet us every single time. 
But what does this teach us? What action is this calling us to? Well, so I know this is going to be a little bit of a stretch for us today. I, I know this is kind of a stretch, but go with me here. Um, we, we know that, uh, just imagine, imagine a world where people cared more about their own image than they do about the people around them. And imagine living in a time where culture actually canceled out people's voices, <laughs> then a world like that, a passage like this, packs a really hard punch. It packs a hard punch because it, it calls us to not follow the example of the crowd, not follow the example of the crowd that remained silent when they had the opportunity to speak up about Jesus. The passage says that no one would say anything publicly about Jesus for fear of the leaders. Now, I don't have a really um, memorable way of putting this um, for us, but the bottom line is this. Their society and our society needs more outspoken Christ followers, not less. We need more outspoken Christ followers, not less. We need more of them. That the greatest gift that the church has to offer the world is not what we do in the world, but who we share, um, who, who we share, the, uh, sh- share to the world. You know, the person of Jesus, that who we are sharing with the world is the most important gift that we have in, to give to the world. Therefore, sharing Jesus openly is more important than believing secretly. This is what the crowd is guilty of. Uh, at least half of the crowd is guilty of. They believe secretly, but they will not say anything publicly. Sharing openly is more important than believing secretly in our society. Because when the truth about Jesus is shared, it gives people an opportunity that their relationship with God can be repaired. The problem that we face in our society is that it believes that it is, it is, it is if I can put it in these terms, it is a cultural sin, it is a cultural sin to proselyze, to try to make converts of Christianity, that it is wrong, we shouldn't do that. We should not try to win people over to our way of thinking, our belief system. Uh, The Barna Group um, is kind of this research group that does um, research with um, Christians and just kind of theological um, surveys and things of that nature, but it's it's done a lot of um, surveys on the topic of evangelism in America. And they have found, get this, that um, Christians ages 43 years of age and older, um, that 70 to 80 percent believed that it was right and good to share your faith with others in the hopes of seeing them become Christians, okay? 70 to 80 percent of uh, believers believe, um, 43 and up, that it is a good thing to share the good news of Christ with other people. Millennials, and younger, um, I'm a millennial, so um, my group and younger, so 42 years old and uh, everyone below that, nearly half of them believed it is wrong to share your faith with others for the sake of seeing them become Christians. Um, To me, this is our culture's way of doing what the religious leaders did, of causing fear to silence people from sharing the most transforming message on earth. Keep that quiet. Keep that to a murmur. Where does this idea come from? The idea that it is somehow wrong to share Jesus with others is rooted in in a set of values that is inherited um, from what people will call um, religious pluralism, which on the surface, it sounds like a good thing. Because it extends freedom and rights to um, all religious, all expressions of worship. But this view is in essence saying that all religions are equally uh, valid and uh, valid in truth and access to God. All religions have an equal access and say about who God is. The danger is the leap that our culture makes with this idea. Our American and by and large Western culture has said that it is actually wrong. It is actually wrong to impose your beliefs on other people. 
And so by sharing Jesus with other people in the hopes of seeing them become Christian, it actually breaks stride. It is actually countercultural from for where our culture's at. Evangelism then, that is sharing the good news of Jesus in hopes that see people come to faith in Christ, is an act of intolerance toward other people's belief systems because when we do that, we're saying that belief is wrong and thus we are acting judgmental. Nobody wants to be seen as being judgmental. And so this, there's this great leveling effect that happens to many churches, to many Christians. Because we believe that it is somehow wrong to share Jesus with others, and so we, we, we shrink back in fear of what other people are going to think about me and my own image, or we're concerned about what this may cost me, or the relationship that, this, that, this may, that, that I may lose in the process of being honest about who Christ is. But here's the irony, and here's the critique. The view that says it's wrong to share your religious views with others is itself a religious view that is trying to make converts to that kind of view. It it, it, it does the very thing it condemns. Unfortunately, that view has found, um, found a strong foothold. It has entered into the back door of many people's lives. And if we're honest, we often don't share anything about Jesus because we like the crowd in the story, we're, we're really concerned about what other people think about us. Uh, maybe we're concerned that, that they'll find out we don't know nearly enough about Jesus that we should. We, we may find ourselves in a position where we don't have all of the answer. We may, we may fear of what may happen in my friendship if, I, if, I, if I'm honest and I bring Jesus to the table. But the fact remains, the world was not changed by an elusive Messiah who was whispering truth about God's kingdom in a dark place. The world was changed because of the public sharing of God's word, of God's kingdom with the world and this is what we see jesus do the same holds true with the early christians these leaders they tried to shut down the churches they tried to shut down the apostles and said look um believe whatever you want but stop preaching in jesus name you remember peter's words he says uh, what do you judge for yourselves is it right for us to obey god or man as far as us we are going to obey god they were unapologetic about the main thing And that was namely Jesus Christ who died for our sins and he rose from the dead. And we cannot stop but proclaim that. And when we grapple with that truth, when we grapple with the gospel, it changes how we look at ourselves and it changes how we look um, at God as well. I I love um, Pastor Timothy Keller who's passed away recently. I love how he frames up the gospel. He says this, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. And yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. The other thing that the gospel does is it changes how we look at our world. It changes how we look at other people. Um, Paul says it best like this in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, for Christ's love, it compels us. It it urges us to get the news out because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. It is a worldly point of view that says that if you share your, um, your, um, the, the gospel with other peoples, that is wrong. That is a worldly point of view. He says, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Let's face it. Sometimes people walk away from the truth. You have family members who have walked away from the truth. You have friends who have walked away from the truth because they would rather hear a lie that feels good than the truth that ultimately saves. As Christians, today we also have to decide, will we believe the lies that say keep quiet or will we believe the truth that says it is worth sharing the good news of Jesus to see people respond and be saved? Do we believe that the truth we hold is worth sharing? We have to decide. We have to decide. Do we believe the lies that the crowd believes in, or do we believe the truth that Jesus proclaims? Let me invite the team to uh, lead us in uh, some songs. Join me in prayer. Father, we ask for your grace and kindness and goodness to us. We ask that as... As we contemplate the, the cost and the call of being ambassadors for your kingdom, being ambassadors of the good news of Jesus, 
We ask for your grace, God, because we stumble in so many areas, especially being representatives of you here. God, forgive us for the many ways that we have taken um, our own agenda and other issues that are really non-issues, and we have made that the primary issue, and we have neglected the good news of the gospel. God, that people have known more things about us that have not been the thing that you were known for. And I ask, Lord, that, that you would reground us, you would regroup us, you would reshape us around the core truth of your gospel, that you died, that you rose, and that you changed lives. Lord, we ask that um, today as we continue to worship you through song, we ask that you would, that you would deal with us as you, you see fit. God, we pray for your conviction, we pray for your comfort, we pray for your guidance. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As a church, our, our, our mission, our heartbeat, is that we would make immature disciples for Christ's church. That whether you are here for a short season or you're here for the duration, that you would be somebody who is a better disciple as a result of being a part of Cornerstone, and that you would be um, Christ's ambassador, that you would serve Christ wherever you are at. And part of what that looks like, it, it, it begins with sharing your... Um, sharing the good news, of sharing in the good news of what Christ has done for you and sharing that good news with other people. Now, um, it's, it's, uh, I, I'm sure there's a lot of really cool and good ways, and, and Jonathan Martin, where are you, Jonathan? Jonathan Martin um, has, has done this really, really good, um, just with getting the good news out and um, just sh- different ways that you can share Christ with other people. Um, but one of the things that um, has always struck me that is just kind of, a, a, I guess, a, an easier way to do this, and one of them I, I got from Jonathan was just to, to ask people, hey, what's your story? Where do you come from? What's your background? Share, share with me your story. And then as they share your, uh, their story with you, there may come a point where they, sh- they ask you, hey, could, tell me your story. What's your story? Where do you come from? And you can bring in the gospel into the mix of talking about how Christ has changed your life and if they want that. The other way is um, just prayer. Like when you think about your neighbors and you think about the people that you work with, they're simply asking them, hey, how can I be praying for you today? How can I be praying for you this week? And letting that seed just grow, that they have somebody that they know they can count on to be praying for them. And there may be a gospel conversation that will grow out of that. Let me close with a, um, a passage. It's not on the screen. It just kind of came to my mind as we were singing. But it is uh, first. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it's a reminder of who we are, of who we belong to. Um, but First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your souls. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Join me in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that... All of our story is that we were nobodies, we were broken. God, that we, we, we encountered you, and we felt convicted, and that led us to praise and worship as we saw the, the power of the cross to forgive all of our sins. And Father, we, I, I pray and I ask that as we leave here today, God, that, that you, would, um, you would give us the courage, that you would give us the boldness. Lord, you know we need it. God, you would give us the right words and even the, the times just to be quiet. And God, that you would help reprioritize our minds and hearts to be centered not on the things of this world, but the, the main thing in this world, which is Christ and Him crucified. Lord, we love you and we ask that you would be the distinguishing mark in our lives and that people would want to know what the difference is. Father, we pray and ask that you would revive us, revive our hearts, revive our town. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.